salutes this week to Caleb Martin on the 26th, Vic Rossi on the 27th, Trudy Wood on the 27th, and Tom Kennedy on the 28th. So have a good day to them. Midweek Bible Group has uh, begun its eighth week lesson DVD series uh, entitled The Invitation of Life. So please attend that if you're able to. Brochures for Camp 252 Summer Youth Retreat are now on the back table. So please uh, take some of those and invite your friends. Also, uh, for the camp, Blue Rock Spring Cleanup will be May 5th. Uh, we'll be leaving here at 7.30 in the morning and plan to be back around noon. There's a lot of cleanup and just uh, tree trimming and things like that uh, that can be done. And we are the first group there, so it's almost like we're actually cleaning it up for ourselves. So anybody that can partake in that will be helpful. And as we can get, the quicker it'll go. Uh, there's a lot in our prayers here. There's a whole uh, prayer list, so please refer to the, the sheet here on that. Uh, we do know that Debbie was uh, in seeing her brother last night in the hospital. That is, uh, prayers go out to her. Also, uh, the new women's stitching group, Threads of Grace, will meet next month on Saturday, May 5th, uh, from 10 until noon. And, um, Talk to Linda a little bit about that. She said it's really rough. I mean, if you're willing to come in and stay in longer than I think it's scheduled over noon, but some people stay until one. I'm really enjoying it. So, anybody interested in taking part in that? It sounds like a good thing. Uh, another thing to me that's kind of exciting is uh, on May 6th, we'll be starting our new uh, study in the morning will be called Home Builders. So Tara will be working on that. So anybody uh, is going to be teaching a lot on just the family, how to raise a good Christian family and things pertaining to that. So it sounds like a real interesting, probably be helpful, helpful for all of us. So please try to attend those. Uh, Cover Dish Luncheon is going to be May 6th. It will be rescheduled from the January for Saturday. Actually, it was not going to be made before the picnic, but since the picnic has been postponed, we will have a cover dish on the first Sunday of May. Okay, so first Sunday of May, we'll be having a cover dish. Work day for the church grounds here will be May 12th from 8 until noon. So we can use all the help of that we can too. If you have any questions on that, please see Shan Wood or Keith Chovey. That's all I have. Is that missed anything? Does anybody have anything you'd like me to bring up? Okay, please bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day you've given us. Thank you for the wonderful sunshine and the warmth that it brings. We thank you, Lord, that we're able to come to learn more about your word freely. Please help us to get as much out of the service as we can to try to learn more about you and take our Christianity out to others try to be good examples to others. Please bless those, Lord, and keep them safe, all those that are serving our country and keeping us in this wonderful, free country. Please help all those on the prayer list that are suffering. Please comfort those and give the doctors wisdom to help all those through their hard times. Most of all, Lord, we thank you for sending your son to die on the cross to forgive us of our sins. We know without you, Lord, we would be lost. And we know that no matter what was done in the past, any sins that any of us has done has been forgiven. We thank you for the grace that you've given us because we deserve none of that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
to each to open our hearts and minds this day, take the lesson that is brought, and apply it to our own lives, and share others in the world that we have contact and influence. Father, we do ask you to do with the leaders of our country. We pray that they will turn and do what is right in your eyes. And Father, we ask you to do with the men and women who are in our protective forces and our, our armed services. Be with those men and women watch more than only you can as they help protect our country and keep our freedom. And at the appointed time, we ask you to bring them home safely. Father, you are so great and so wonderful. We are so thankful for all that you do and how you bless us. We thank you for giving us your only begotten Son to be our Savior and to sacrifice for us sinners. We thank you this day for allowing us to bring them mercy. We thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you for answering our prayers. We ask this prayer through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. During the offering this morning, we'll be singing number 198. It won't be on the screen. You'll have to use your books. 190. Give them my Now to prepare minds for the Lord's Supper, we'll sing 335. Yeah.
and help us now to return a portion of that that might be used for the betterment of your word, for the spread of your word, and for saving the rest of mankind, making them realize what we have in Christ's name.
Suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha, Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took him, took hold of his garment and tore it in two. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Went now to the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. Then he struck the water. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and left, and he crossed over. Thank you very much, Josh, for that reading. Welcome all of you this morning. <clears throat> we do have a children's Bible time for the little ones. <clears throat> I had something kind of funny happen to me this morning. I was coming down the little aisle. It was a little bit crowded, and I was kind of weeping my way around. And I, I uh, passed Jay Lombardi. She was uh, trying to herd uh, Nico into the seat where he's at now in front of Pat and, and Lois. And uh, we kind of, our Jay and I kind of made contact. I think her shoulder or elbow kind of touched my abdomen. Uh, and and uh, when, it, when that happened, I heard her say, suck it up, Buttercup, and get in there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I on my and sucked it up. And she said, I was talking to you. And I said, I know, but I said, I kind of like that thing. <laughs> I've never been called Buttercup before, but maybe it'll catch on. <laughs> Also had something kind of bizarre, strange happen this morning. We had visitors with us, uh, Leo and uh, Cindy Williams from the Jacksonville, Florida area. Are, are you camping at Mosquito? Mm -hmm. Now see, that, that's, I want to interrogate you all after because that's always a fascinating study to me. <laughs> Why anybody would travel that way around the country to camp at a ground called Mosquito Lake. <laughs> There's been debate over the years as to whether we should change the name to get more people in. <laughs> but it's not normally the kind of thing that you think, well, let's flip a coin. Do you have family living here? I was born and raised in Youngstown. Oh, so. there you go. Do you, do you understand? <laughs> and I will say this. Uh, we walked into a big old gang of gnats. And at first we thought, oh, that was mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> we live up to our name. <laughs> But anyway, uh, as we were meeting them, <clears throat> I, uh, Leo was talking with, I think, Maggie, and I, I was uh, introducing myself to Cindy, and uh, Cindy said she was from Jacksonville, and I said, uh, I, I was uh, born in Pensacola. She said, so was I. And she said, my dad was in the Navy, and I said, so was I. And she said, I was born in the Navy hospital. She said, I said, so was I. <laughs> And she said, smiling, she said, I was born in 1953. And I said, so was I. <laughs> and then we, uh, if she would have said that I was born on the day after Christmas, I would have fallen over. <laughs> I think we had a real, uh, one of those coming together things. But we're glad to have you folks with us this morning. I think spring is coming. I know we've been teased a little bit, and we think not, but uh, if, 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 uh, here's my version of prognostic, prognosticating. I was sitting in my office on Monday, and uh, actually prior to that, I had, uh, maybe some of the rest of you, uh, I don't know what causes this, but we have a, a, a blacktop driveway, but something overnight when we, I don't know if it was from Sunday night or Monday morning, but the driveway was polluted with worms. Worms all over the place. And then the next day, all of a sudden landing on a bench right outside my window, right by my keyboard, was the fattest robin I have ever seen. <laughs> it looked like Mr. Potato Head with a little tiny grape or a head of fluffed out. And uh, I didn't think much about it except I was just made, I was just stunned at the size of this robin. 
And Jeannie came later uh, on and said, man, I saw the fattest Rob in the day. And, uh, and then I noticed there were no more worms on the ground. <laughs> Not a one. I couldn't find a single worm. Mark and I got a chuckle out of it. That was the, I think that uh, Robin really didn't clean up the driveway. <laughs> well, let's open our Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 2, and let's get a little serious for just a little bit, if we can. <clears throat> we, today, we bring to a close our study of the days of Elijah. I don't know what it has done for you, uh, but it has been good for me. I have enjoyed preparing uh, sermons for this series. It has uh, extended really from the start of the uh, new year. <clears throat> Those of you who are snowbirds uh, have missed out on our series on Elijah. And you can go online and uh, pull up old sermon notes if it intrigues you and you want to follow with us. This final episode in the life of the prophet Elijah is unique. Uh, it has an ending that is unlike anything else in all of Scripture. The only life ending story that approaches it is the story of an Old Testament patriarch by the name of Enoch. Enoch, if you remember, was the father of a son named Methuselah, who that son Methuselah ended up being uh, living to the age of 969. If we're having a little Bible quiz and I'd say who's the oldest person ever mentioned in the Bible, it would be Methuselah. But Enoch was his father. And uh, in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 21 and 24, here's, here's what it says about Enoch's end of life experience. To be precise here, it's not, it's not really an end of life experience because Enoch doesn't really die. It's, a, it's an end of life on planet Earth experience if we wanted to be particular there. The Bible says in verse 21 of Genesis 5, <clears throat> Enoch lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah. <coughs> then Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. This is in the what we call the antediluvian world, and we think in the days before the flood. Um, it seems like according to scripture, men and, men and women lived longer. Uh, but it goes on to finish the text, says, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. In a few minutes, we're going to come to the end of life on planet Earth for Elijah. But before we get there, let's uh, look at some of the details that lead up to this uh, supernatural conclusion. If you know the story of Elijah, you, you know how it's going to end. But even if you do know how it's going to end, it, it will still be a thrill to read and study it this morning as we conclude this series. We last saw in Elijah in Samaria. If you go back to the very opening, uh, the second verse of 2 Kings chapter 1, uh, the, the king at that time, the, the son of King Ahab is Ahaziah, and he has fallen through the lattice from the upper chamber of his palace, and he's uh, very, very injured. He, he doesn't know if he's going to live or not, and his palace is in Samaria. And so it's to Samaria that uh, eventually God sends Elijah the prophet to tell the king that you're not going to get up from your bed, you're going to die. So Elijah was in Samaria where he spoke that somber utterance to the king. It was so somber and so serious because Ahaziah 
had sought. He made inquiry of the pagan god Beelzebub, the pagan god of Ekron. He went, sent messengers, tried to send messengers to inquire of that god as to whether or not he would recover. And of course, uh, Jehovah God, knowing that Beelzebub is not a god at all, was not at all pleased with King Ahaziah's uh, behavior. So he finally uh, allowed Elijah to go and to say to the king, you're not going to recover. And the main, the main reason is because you sought Beelzebub instead of seeking after me. So now we're coming to 2 Kings chapter 2. That's where we'll bring this study to a close today. It, it, it opens in the first part of the first verse. It came about when the Lord was about to take out Elijah by a whirlwind to heaven. In, in the verses that follow then, we find that Elijah the prophet, somehow he comes to know that God is about to take him into heaven. So he embarks upon uh, uh, what would become the, la the last day or the last days of, of his life on earth. I'll talk about that in just a minute, but for right now I want us to go to, uh, let's take a step in the imagination station. Is that what they call it out at Missouri Park? And let's try our best to imagine that God has spoken to me or you, and in speaking to us, God has revealed to us that this would be our last day. This is going to be our last day or last days on planet Earth. If that happened to you, what would you do? Here, okay, let's just really stretch our imagination a little bit. Who, if God spoke to me or you this morning early and said today's your last day, what, what would we do? Who, who would we try to visit? What calls might we make? How would we spend our last hours? I don't really have a, a technical bucket list, nothing I've ever written down. I have, I have a few things in my head that I'd like to see before I die, but it's not a, an official list or anything that I'm bent on trying to accomplish it. But I, I think that I, I would hope that our bucket list of things to do would take on a, a more spiritual tone. Jayla Morty was saying she's seen almost all, all 50 states, and so she, she and some of the family are going to go up to New Hampshire. It's one of the remaining states that she hasn't been in. But if, if Jay, if, if God spoke to Jay this morning and said, this is your last day, I doubt that Jay is going to call mom and dad and say, we have to get to New Hampshire today, early this morning, because that's all right. No. See, our whole, our whole perspective changes when this happens, doesn't it? We, we wouldn't, surely, we wouldn't be wasting our final hours on things trivial. We've got to get home and watch the race. We're going to get home and watch golf. Or... And one would like to think that our, the focus of our last day would be on people, that it would be people oriented. We'd probably, probably be hugging a lot of people and expressing our love to others. And most importantly, and hopefully this is taken care of already by the way that we live, we would certainly give due diligence uh, to setting our spiritual house in order. I have a little uh, 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 steel box that uh, has some personal stuff in it and it's kind of tucked away and but Jeannie knows that if I if I kick the bucket unexpectedly sometime one of the first things she needs to do is uh, is get the key well you know where the key is now to the box right that's not, let me remind you of that because I oh, in the in the I don't mean to paint the picture that she's a, a dunce and needs guidance so badly but uh, it, there's a, a list of all kinds of things, you know, uh, 
from uh, bank information to anyway. Uh, why, why did I even bring that up? We, we were talking about uh, last days, and if uh, if our last day was to come, I don't I don't know that we were sitting around thinking about. Well, I really wanted to go to the Indians game, or we're, it's people oriented. It's thinking about things that, that really, really matter. Elijah is growing older, but he doesn't sit still. He 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 begins a trek that uh, takes him about 50 miles, if you can imagine it. I don't know exactly how old he is at this time, but he, he's not a young man. He's getting up there in years. And it's possible, uh, this is where I want to clarify a moment ago, it's possible that this final pilgrimage might have covered more than just one day. The text doesn't actually tell us this was Elijah's last day, but it sounds pretty, pretty serious. <coughs> Chapter 2 and verse 1, it came about when the Lord was about to take up Elijah by a whirlwind of heaven, that then Elijah began this journey. He could have covered this ground 50 miles in one day if you just walked at a casual pace, what is it, three miles an hour? So you can do the math, but that would really eat up most of the day, 15 hours of just walking from place to place. So it seems reasonable to me to think that there's more than just 24 hours or just a short period of time involved in this, that it might include a, a, a day or two or three or I don't know. So he's going to take a trip and it starts up there in Samaria and then he's going to travel to a place called Gilgal. You can see this um, in the text, the first few verses. And then from Gilgal he's going to go on to a, a town called Bethel. And then one that is probably most famous to us to, to Jericho. And then he's finally going to end up at, on the, at the Jordan River. And that's where his life on earth will come to an end. But I want to ask, what's so important about Gilgal and Bethel and Jericho? Of, of all the places that he could go, why did he want to visit these places? Again, let's just play this imagination game. If God said to me, Terry, this is your last day, Am I going to think, okay, I'm going to visit these cities today? These cities have really been. For, for a man of God like Elijah, a faithful prophet who has seen so much throughout his lifetime, we, we can't help but wonder how he's going to spend his last days. Now, each of these stops in this little itinerary that unfolds, each of these stops or each of these sites is rich in sacred history. Spiritually speaking, all of these places, all three of them, uh, Gilgal, Bethel, and Jericho, uh, they, they all are very special places in, in, in the pages of Scripture. For example, Gilgal, when the children of Israel finally were able to, uh, 40 years later, to leave the uh, Egyptian bondage and work their way through the wilderness. It wasn't 40 years because they uh, got lost. Somebody said, well, Moses was leading the way. And if he would have stopped and asked, they could have got there a lot sooner. No, this was punishment for their unbelief and their lack of trust. So for 40 years, and then finally they came uh, to the land of Canaan and they they crossed the Jordan and camped at a place called Gilgal. And there they began to devise plans for taking down uh, the city of Jericho. Uh, th this was uh, very important. It was uh, an assembly point for Jericho and all the children of Israel. They had camped there getting ready for the battle. This is in Joshua chapter 4 and verse 19. Bethel, on the other hand, if we can stay in the order in which it's presented to us, but we're going to come back to Jericho in a moment. But Bethel was a place of prayer. And it was a sacred site, especially as we connect it with Abraham. 
the very word Bethel means house of house of God. That's from Genesis 12 and verse 8. And this was a place where Father Abraham had built an altar and where he often uh, came to meet with Jehovah God. It's a very significant place in the history of the nation of Israel. Jericho, I think we know, was, I don't know how we could equate Jericho. Jericho was to the Hebrew people what, what uh, D-Day and Normandy might have been like for us um, as uh, American citizens. Uh, it, uh, here the nation of Israel is going to drive a wedge into the pagan nations that are occupying the land of Canaan. And uh, this is told in Joshua chapter 6. So it's, it's a very significant, it's not just a significant first battle, but it's significant for, for uh, all that takes place in the conquest of Canaan. And finally, at the River Jordan, you know uh, that the River Jordan is uh, steeped in significance uh, from a Hebrew point of view. It was here that these stones of remembrance were erected when they crossed the uh, Jordan River going into the land of Canaan. That's told us, uh, we're told about that in Joshua chapter 4, verses 5 and 7. And, and then from a New Testament perspective, uh, remember John 4, or John 3 and verse 23 tells us that John was baptizing at Enon near Salem. This is a, a point on the Jordan River because there was much water. We often use that to talk about how baptism really is in worship. But so the Jordan River was uh, important for so many things, but think how many people had had their sins washed away, uh, uh, the, were baptized for the forgiveness of sins, even by John the baptizer uh, in, the, in the River Jordan. But having said all of that, I, I, I just don't think it, it's, it's not just that these are sacred sites that are driving Elijah to go to these places. Our text in, indicates that these first three places were homes to the sons of the prophets. And that, that then makes sense out of this. Look at uh, verse 2 and following. Verse 1 ends by saying, Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And then verse 2, Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here please, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elijah, Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Uh, then the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from you today? And he said, yes, I know. Be still. Be quiet. And Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But Elisha said back to him, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho approached Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And uh, Elisha said, Yes, I know. Be quiet. Be still. Then Elisha said to him, to Elisha, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you for the... For the so, and so the two of them went on. Now let, let's pause there for just a moment. So these are sacred sites, but what we find... And actually, you have to go to 2 Kings 5 and verse 38 to see that there's also a school of prophet. In each of these towns, Gilgal, Bethel, and Jericho, there are schools.